But it's time for the big interview. I'm delighted to be joined by the accidental leader, in some, some would say, of the Labour Party, uh, who, whether he intended it or not, is redefining our politics. Very good to see you this morning. Thanks for coming in. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, You're welcome. Uh, as you all recognise. Now, um, you yourself said to your own MPs only a few days ago that you didn't think that the local elections results and the national election results we've seen were a sufficient platform to win the next election. You are at this stage of the parliament, according to those elections, about 1% ahead of the Tories. Ed Miliband was about 7 or 8% at the comparable period of the last parliament and he lost. So what do you need to do to take Labour forward and, and, and give yourselves a fighting chance of winning in 2020? The election we had last week were a big step forward. We did finish ahead of the Tories. But we only did, by a whisker. Well, we came a long way from 2015 and we were defending seats last contested in 2012, which was a particularly good year for the Labour Party in local elections. We did gain control of Lancaster Council. We spectacularly won the moralities in London and Bristol, where... Although in London, <clears throat> you know, rather conspicuously, Sadiq Khan, the new mayor, did try and distance himself from you, didn't he? I campaigned with him, for him and for the party. It was a coming together of the entire Labour movement and Labour Party in London and an utter rejection of the nasty politics of Linton Crosby and the Tories trying to bring a racist element into the election in London. I congratulate Sadiq on his election. But we also gained seats in a number of other places and um, very importantly, we either held or gained seats in towns that are represented by Conservative MPs, such as in Carlisle, such as in Crawley, such as in Hastings, such as part of Southampton. Now, as I mentioned to Liz, this recent Fabian analysis shows that you did rather better in terms of making progress in the South than in the North and Midlands, where you actually lost a share of the vote. That's pretty disturbing, isn't it, if you're losing your way in your heartlands? Well, the election results are inevitably slightly patchy across the country. There are some local places you do particularly well, others, others you don't. We did gain seats from the Liberals in Newcastle. We gained seats from the Greens in Norwich. We gained seats from Conservatives in other places. And so, yes, I would want us to do better, of course. I think as a party, we're reaching out. We're having very big increases in membership all over the country, but not evenly spread. Spread. And uh, I'm looking forward to further increases in membership and further campaigning, particularly in the North East. Now, in uh, constituencies one might have traditionally defined as more working class, UKIP is doing better against you. There are concerns about the immigration issue. Do you think those concerns are legitimate? I think we have to ensure that shortages of housing and shortages of school places and pressure on hospitals is dealt with by sufficient funding and investment into local communities and local economies by central government. This government is spectacularly underfunding local authorities, particularly in the poorest inner city areas of this country. You could lay a map of poverty in Britain and lay a map of the largest level of local expenditure cuts and they would be the same places but over the whole country so that is important so, so, but, but and we also have to remember sorry. that um, those that um, work in our health service make sure our health service survives are often people that have come to live in this country either from outside Europe or within Europe migration actually is a plus to our economy as a whole those people pay a lot in taxes receive much less on average in benefits than the rest of the community and make an amazing contribution to our community so, so, London, well, I do want to this, though, that, it is about the resource <clears throat> that we devote to local schools, local hospitals, to cater for a rising population that is the issue for you. The sheer numbers of people coming in the issue, for you is not the question. The issue is resources. The issue so you is wouldn't want to stem the flow of, of, of migration to the The UK. issue is also recognising the numbers of British people who go and live elsewhere. Two million British people live within the European Union, main, France and many other countries. There is a free movement of people around Europe I think that is generally a good thing, but, and this is a very important caveat, we have to ensure that the Posting of Workers Directive is agreed, which will prevent this gross exploitation of often low-paid workers from Eastern Europe being brought wholesale 
into, say, construction work in Britain or in other places where they're designed to destroy industry-wide agreements or undercut local wage doubles. There has to be a, an end to that um, cynical exploitation of free market labour rules. But the people, even within your own <coughs> party, who worry about social cohesion because of the rapid change in the makeup of individual communities, th those concerns are just wrong, are they? You have to ensure that communities uh, are brought together, that people do understand the changes that are happening and uh, actually see some plus and some benefit within it. You look at um, various towns where there's been a big change, quite often the economy has actually begun to grow after that level of migration. There's been actually very good levels of community understanding and integration. Now some would say one of the slightly well, oddest of odd couples at the top of politics at the moment, uh, you and the Prime Minister, campaigning to keep us who's, in who's saying this <laughs> the eu referendum oh, you're, really? an okay. inter, you're an interesting pairing at the top there um and a bit, what a, what a, a bit unlikely i'd say actually. Unlikely. i don't know where you're getting your information um, from you need to check your research um, now one of the reasons people think it's unlikely is because you do say very different things about brussels he says he wants less interference from brussels and the european union you say you want a european union that protects workers rights and interferes with companies to make sure they behave in your terms well this is desperately confusing for people isn't it if the two main proponents of staying in the eu are saying incredibly different things about why we should stay in the eu well they can listen to both of us and make up their own minds i want to chase down tax evasion i want to chase down companies that exploit people i want to chase down those that are denying the extension of equal rights all across Europe and I want Europe to respond to the refugee crisis in a decent humane way which shares out the responsibility for helping those people. Would, would um, there be any point in you standing on a stage with the Prime Minister during this campaign do you think? I don't think it would work. <laughs> But, do, you, do you think it would now, now prime... I mean, be good television but it's not going to happen okay. Um, now, um, uh, the Prime Minister um, has made it clear he does not want to debate Boris Johnson. He's desperately worried about the image that would paint of a divided Tory party. Would you be prepared to debate Boris Johnson head to head? Well, Boris Johnson has some very odd interpretations of history. I mean, his, uh, I, I think he actually needs to take some lessons off Jacob Rees-Mogg because he's a better historian than Boris Johnson. I don't want to cause any dissent within the Tory party, but you've got one better historian than the other. They may fall out over this. He, he's sort of claiming that the um, Roman Empire was a failed enterprise that tried to unite Europe. Well, it didn't unite all of Europe. It never managed Scotland and was endlessly at war in Germany, but it, it did last quite a long time, like 500 so years So the EU for you is the equivalent of the Roman Empire? No, 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 no. You're about to misquote me now. No, no, it's no not. I'm just wanting to, yeah. I want to get no, the, right. the European Union is now of um, a very wide number of member states. It does allow free movement, free movement of people. It does have some important basic human rights principles within it. It does have some important principles on working time directive, holidays, um, discrimination and rights, uh, and rights of people at work. Those things are very important. But I want to see a Europe that is a unity of people of the left, of people in trade unions, of people in progressive organisations, people in social organisations, actually collectively working for a better standard of living across Europe and not accepting this idea that big business can run Europe or that we have to accept the transatlantic trade and investment partnership which essentially enfranchises corporations at the expense of national governments. Now uh, we've Does all... That we, you? Very unbelievably helpful. Uh, now we've all got uh, families and they don't always say things uh, that suit us. You've got a brother, Piers, who... I've got two brothers. Who, well, I know, but this is a particular one who says you are actually in your solar you're a sceptic and he thinks there's a chance when you go into that ballot box that you're going to vote for leaving the EU. Does your brother know you better than the rest of us? He's a, a weather forecaster, not a psychologist. So you're definitely not going to vote to, no, to leave? I've made my position very clear of uh, why I think the Labour Party has made the decision it has and the trade unions of this country made the decision they have about um, a Remain vote and that's what I'm putting forward and if, uh, if Piers knows different then I'll give him a call later and have a word with him, okay. Right. Well look, don't go away because we've got more from Jeremy Corbyn after the break. So welcome back to Pestered on Sunday. We've nicked his bike, so Jeremy Corbyn is still with me. But first, Allegra, 
What's our viewer saying about my chat with Labour's leader? <laughs> well, our viewer actually just so happens to be Nicola Sturgeon, and we have a new story on our hands. So we were looking earlier at petitions, and we were looking at this uh, petition to get people allowed to wear what they want, basically, high heels or not. And this one here, this tweet to us, it's from Nicola Sturgeon this morning. She's just about to go to an official engagement. Anyway, this is what she's... They don't look hugely comfy, but nor do mine. No woman should be ever be told what they can or can't wear. And as if that wasn't enough, I wanted her to clarify... Is she, is she supporting that petition? And so she tweeted at me, yes. I wear high heels because I want to. Me too. No one should be forced to. Anyway, before we go back to you, we just want to take a quick look at Jeremy Corbyn's communications strategy. In the first seven days of his leadership, one analysis said that of some 500 pieces about Corbyn, 60% were negative. Ouch. So he has become the first party leader to get on this thing, Snapchat. It allows him to go straight to the under-24s and avoid the mainstream media. Is that us? I don't know. Hanging out with junior doctors here. He likes telestrating as much as I do. This here, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? I've, anyway, I'm trying to telestrate on the telestration. Anyway, that's the hugging emoji. This was the moment he wanted to get young voters out to vote last Thursday on election day. And here he is having a not very healthy looking dinner. But is this the real Jeremy Corbyn? Why no pictures of his cat El Gato or his favourite drain covers? Is he being genuinely intimate or, dare I say it, is he spinning Snapchat? Labour does have more under 27-year-old supporters than the Lib Dems have members. Ouch. So, Robert, can this get him to power? Well, we're about to find out, I suppose, or at least get more of an inkling. Well, why no, why no pictures of El Gato? That was a falafel. It was a falafel. Well, it's it's totally healthy. healthy. It I'm not too, I'm not too keen healthy. on the expanded polystyrene uh, yeah. box it was in there. OK, well, we might come back to the Middle Eastern theme in a minute. But the, <clears throat> I suppose I wanted to start with a slightly broader question. Um, all parties are coalitions. Um, in a long career as a backbencher, you didn't have to compromise all that much. And, you know, rather famously, you did vote against the government and the, your own party. Uh, once or twice, um, you are having to compromise as a leader in order to keep the party together. How comfortable do you find that process of compromising? It's very interesting. Very interesting. I've appointed a shadow cabinet, which does reach out, and I said I would all through the leadership campaign. I have tried to... But do you to... feel comfortable making these concessions against things that historically well, you've why, found... do, why do you think it's a concession to lead the party? Well, no, I'm thinking about individual issues. Ah. On individual issues, I have put my view very clearly. Fundamentally, the most important one is on economic policy, where we have very much changed the narrative. We're an anti-austerity party. We've pointed out that austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. We're developing an economic strategy which is about economic justice. It is about expanding our economy. It is about maintaining and expanding the welfare state and security of people and challenging the narrative that the next generation is poorer than this one and the one after that gets progressively poorer and challenging the levels of inequality in society. I think that's a pretty big change but in Labour's far, fundamental economic message. How far <coughs> could you personally compromise? I mean, you've campaigned against nuclear weapons all your life. It's inconceivable, isn't it? Nothing that, that, changed that, my that, views that, on nuclear so weapons that's inconceivable that a Labour led by you could back Trident, irrespective of this review that's Look, going on? <clears throat> review is going on, we're taking evidence, we're having discussions. The points I made all through the leadership campaign I've made all my life is that I don't think nuclear weapons are a defence, I think they're a weapon of mass destruction, and I think we should maintain our position of full support for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and therefore take steps for disarmament. I'm opposed to the renewal of Trident, I've made that very clear all of my life. We're having that discussion and that debate, but it's also about a strategy that ensures that those highly skilled workers that make Trident and other weapons are used for their skills to be maximised to develop other products. Now, you've also campaigned against racism all your yes. life. Uh, your <coughs> old friend Ken Livingstone made this extraordinary remark, or a remark that many thought was extraordinary, that a real anti-Semite doesn't just hate Jews in Israel. You can't let him back into the party, can you? Well, he was suspended from membership, as have some others, a not very large number, but some others, where there appears to be remarks or things they've said or done, uh, which we're not happy about. Those are being come back? Can I, can I finish? Those are, those are being um, investigated at the moment, and in order to 
bring a um, proper process towards this. I asked uh, Shami Chakrabarti to head up a commission of inquiry, which she's doing, and she will take evidence from anybody who wishes to give it. She will come up with proposals on how we do a rule change and how we have a process for dealing with this. I'm absolutely clear. I am absolutely opposed to anti-Semitism in any form. But he did cross a line, therefore, didn't he? The suspension was because of the remarks he made. And I'm sorry to press you on this, but I mean, I know there's a process, but genuinely, do you think there's any chance he can come back in? Let the process work. Um, you have said that you are opposed to both terrorism and anti-Semitism, but some people felt that what you said to the Prime Minister about your remarks relating to friendship with Hezbollah and Hamas were ambiguous. Do you want to clear that up now? I don't think they're ambiguous at all. But I you have, are opposed to Hamas and Hezbollah? Of course I'm opposed to them and I made that very clear. I have met them. Indeed I've met many organisations with whom I profoundly disagree either with their aims or their methods or their objectives but I do make the point that if you're to develop a peace process in the Middle East or anywhere else in this world for that matter you have to have serious conversations and negotiations with all the forces involved otherwise what do you do actually make the situation worse listen the Northern Ireland parallel is sometimes a bit overplayed but nevertheless it's an important one the Successive British governments thought there was a military solution in Northern Ireland. They spent millions of pounds, thousands of troops and hundreds of lives were lost in pursuing a military conflict in Northern Ireland. Ultimately, it was resolved so far by a political process which had respect for the traditions of both um, communities, if you like, in, in Northern Ireland. And we reached a, a compromise, we reached a settlement, we reached a political process. That surely is an interesting model. That required meetings between people who profoundly disagreed with each other, who adopted methods that the both sides profoundly disagreed with, but nevertheless a settlement was reached. Had we started from that process, rather than trying to get a military solution, we might have saved a lot of lives. Um, just a very quick <coughs> final question. Some people say you don't understand the middle classes. And just by chance, I've seen the rather lovely house you grew up in, Yew Tree Manor. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful house uh, with huge, huge gardens. I think uh, whoever owns it now has spent a lot more money well, on it than my mum or dad ever it, were able it, to. Actually. Even so, I mean, it was a pretty nice place, nice to, place to, to, to grow up. It was, you, I want to, very simple question. Do you think of yourself as middle class? Oh, God. I don't know. Listen, I live in my own house. Well, it's, it's a shared ownership with a bank, actually. It's called, it's called a mortgage these days. Um, I, I, live in a, I live in a house. I'm an owner-occupier in my constituency. That puts me in a minority. Yes, every MP has a lifestyle which is, I suppose, more or less middle class. But I see myself as somebody that represents and proud to represent a community of the poor and, and, and the better off. But above all, it's a community that wants to come together to ensure that everybody, everybody, can achieve their maximum in life and in society. That's what a better Britain would look like. Jeremy Corby, many thanks. Okay. So, in a moment, a moment, more from Liz Kendall and Jacob Rees-Mogg, but Allegra's revving up screening again. The camera crew were actually laughing at that joke Jeremy Corbyn made about the mortgage. We've also had a tweet in from Wes Streeting, a Labour MP who has been critical about you, but you might be, you might be relieved to know that today he thought you did a good interview and it was good to hear, I might as well just show you it, it was good to hear oh, that you were talking about the EU referendum as much as you were.